your assets have been frozen for the next 180 days. That's what you might be hearing real soon if the government institutes new withdrawal freezes. And that is the latest prediction from a well-known and very accomplished hedge fund manager with some new warnings that history is about to repeat itself. In today's video, I want to explain why this individual believes that the government may have no other option but to freeze withdrawals and freeze capital flight if current trends continue. And then to conclude this video, we will go over some of the data in terms of the inflation report that we just got and what it means moving forward for the market and monetary policy, what the Fed is going to do next. And we'll put all the timestamps down below. Also, quick plug, today's video is brought to you by ZipTraderU and our 60% off coupon code WAR, which will expire at midnight tonight. We were going to expire it last night, but because our video last night got delayed, we're going to go ahead and extend that to tonight. But this is the last chance, and we won't have another 60% off coupon code until Black Friday. So this is actually the lowest that you're going to be able to get the price for until Black Friday. So make sure to give it a look with that first link down below, and we'll be happy to welcome you to the team. Okay, so right now we are in a situation where bank after bank after bank is collapsing. But every time a bank collapses, you'll hear a bunch of news coverage on it for maybe a week, but then everyone has to shut up and assume that no other bank will ever collapse ever again. Shortly after each bank collapse, you'll have politicians, media professionals, professionals, and you'll have your bank. CEOs coming out and saying, don't worry, everything is fine. This is the last collapse. You're not going to see any more collapse evos. And then a few weeks later, what happens? Well, you get the next collapse, rinse and repeat. We're supposed to act like bank collapses that rival 2008 are completely normal and are a symptom of a really, really strong economy. If you question that, you're just a little dirty fear monger and you're just stupid and you're being brainwashed by conspiracy theorists. Bank collapses equal good economy. The fact of the matter is that it's very, very difficult to get a true opinion on the banking sector because the banking sector is so susceptible to crowd psychology and crowd-based panics. The banking sector is so dependent on public opinion that if people don't narrative control and public opinion weakens really, really quickly, well, the whole thing could collapse. The house of cards comes tumbling. Regulators don't want that. Banks don't want that. Investors certainly don't want that. And customers can't have that. But there's that ethical dilemma for anybody that is conversing with the public. Public. That ethical dilemma of, okay, well, we could tell the truth, but if we tell the truth, people are going to pull their funds. And that's going to mean the thing that we're fearing the most, bank collapses, more bank collapses, is going to become much, much more true. So what have those in charge been doing? Well, they've just been lying or at the very least misleading. How do they do this? Well, they say the banking sector is stronger than ever. And then when the next bank collapses, they said, oh, no, we weren't talking about the banking sector. We were talking about the banking sector. Yeah, the, the banking sector, that's screwed. But the banking sector, oof, that dough, never been stronger. You want some muffins? Because here's some muffins. You can't get your money back. But here's some muffins. You want blueberry or banana nut? So right now we're in an environment where narrative controlling is being used to keep the banking sector as solvent as can be. However, it's not working for everybody and every single day more people wake up and it causes more and more runs on banks. But based on current trends, it seems very, very soon we're going to be in a situation where capital flight is so severe that the government is going to have to step in and stop it. When narrative controlling no longer works, the government has to go into forced seizures, has to go into forced freezing, draconian regulations to stop capital flight. This is something that you've seen in China many times. This is something that you've seen in Russia many times and specifically after the invasion when they're currency was collapsing. And this is something that you've seen in the US during other crises. This is what hedge fund manager and macroeconomic expert Hugh Hendry is predicting for the US banking system. Quote, my fear, and I do not say this lightly, given the present peril with regard to the magnitude of losses on security portfolios held within predominantly the regional banks, you have to cast your mind back to 1934 and the Gold Reserve Act. I can actually conceive of a federal or treasury rule coming in and saying for the next 180 days, you cannot pull your money out of the banking sector. So here he's saying a new rule from the US government that says, hey, you can't pull your money out of the banking sector for 180 days, 180 days. Now, where is the precedent for this? Well, he refers to 1934 and this Gold Reserve Act. But what happened then? Well, the Gold Reserve Act of 1934 was an act passed by Congress that made it illegal, illegal for US citizens to own gold certificates, gold coins, and gold bullion. And essentially, gold was seized by the US government and made completely illegal. 
Only the government could have gold. If you held gold, you could be fined up the wazoo and or jailed. What was the reason for this policy? Well, the USD had been backed by gold since the 1800s, and prior to the Great Depression, the Federal Reserve had more than enough gold reserves to pay out anyone who wanted to convert their dollars to gold. However, as the Great Depression waged on and 1933 rolled around, well, Americans were concerned with the value of the dollar, and so what did they do? Well, they rushed to the bank and the Federal Reserve and tried to convert their dollars into gold. However, the Fed and U.S. authorities were worried that they wouldn't be able to satisfy all of these gold requests, gold withdrawal requests, as immediately as they needed to, and there would be a massive liquidity crisis. As banks around the U.S. saw massive, massive lines everywhere, well, the U.S. banking system was in peril. And so FDR decided to declare a bank holiday and suspended all bank transactions for a week, making it so that people couldn't withdraw. They froze the banking sector. You had what was at the time an unprecedented encroachment from the federal government into the private banking sector, which was a lot more privatized at that time. And later on, they instituted these changes to gold policy. And the Treasury and financial institutions were prevented from converting dollars and deposits into gold coins and other similar assets. They instituted a long list of draconian policies in order to control the banking sector and to stop U.S. citizens from panicking out of it and collapsing it. So in other words, in a time of crisis, the government will do what? Well, the government will be more than willing to freeze withdrawals, ban the trade of gold or other assets that hold their value and purchasing power if it screws with the fiat currency, seize those assets if need be, and make it illegal to hold those assets if need be, and especially make it illegal to export them. Now, the goal of this was to stabilize and renew confidence in the banking sector, to stabilize the economy, and to stabilize the currency. And this was all possible to get through the government because of the massive, massive crisis at that time. And economists can argue back and forth about whether these were good measures or bad measures over the long run, but the fact of the matter is that they prove one thing, that you're only one crisis away from the government deciding to throw the book at you. If you look at just American history, the last 100 years, even the last four years, if you really want to be specific, you could see that government has no problem encroaching on any sort of right that you think you have, even the right to own gold, if there's a big enough crisis. And so for folks who are completely convinced, completely convinced that the government would never encroach on your digital numbers on a screen on your mobile phone, you've got another thing coming. It's a lot easier to freeze digital withdrawals than it was to freeze banks all across the country, to confiscate gold all across the US. Those things are much, much more difficult to institute. Going back to hedge fund manager Hendry, he tells you to look over at the M2 money supply and what is happening right now. Sometimes it's kind of relevant to panic. I would recommend you panic. You've seen the biggest waterfall decline in M2 right now. M2 is deposits, not loans. Read that again. M2 is deposits, not loans. That's the deposits fleeing the system and going into money market funds. You pull up the M2 money supply data. Here it is. It is diving. Meaning what? Well, it means there's a massive flight of deposits. Where is this money going? It's going into money market funds. It's going into T-bills or T-bonds. It's being converted into commodities. It's leaving the country and going elsewhere. Maybe it's going to go into the new BRICS currency. The problem with this capital flight, well, this is very, very similar to when everybody was rushing from the USD to gold back in 1933 and 34. People didn't trust the value of the dollar, so they're like, okay, I want something else. And so now the US government has to figure out how to go in and prop up its fake currency. Otherwise, more and more regional banks are going to collapse, and that might just keep spiraling and snowballing until you get to the bigger banks, which is going to be a much bigger nightmare for authorities. When a lot of this M2 money supply went into banks in the first place, what did the banks do with it? They put it into low yielding and now toxic bonds. Some of them gave high risk loans with it. Some of them put it into other toxic assets. And so now when all these deposits are leaving these banks and going elsewhere, well, the banks don't have the liquidity to pay it out. The banks are still stuck in all these toxic assets. And the more and more deposits fly out, the more and more capital flies out of these banks, well, the rougher and worse the situation is going to get. And eventually, if the government doesn't go in and freeze withdrawals, well, what's going to happen? Well, the entire sector is going to collapse. Could the government pull another 1933, 1934 and do some bank holidays, do some asset seizures? We're no longer on the gold standard, but could there be other forms of asset seizures? Maybe they're taking real estate. Maybe they are taking gold. Maybe they're taking anything to prop up the currency. Maybe they're making it so that you can't hold silver and all these other alternatives to the US dollar. Maybe they're banning cryptocurrency. Would the US government do that if 
they needed to save the US dollar? Let us know your thoughts down below. A lot of people think the US government would only do things that we like. If you think the US government will always be our friend and would never do anything that we disagree with, you could also let us know that down below. And then let us know what you're smoking. In terms of what Hendry recommends, he says, quote, it's time to own the most reveled security in the universe, the ultra long treasuries. I know you all think we've got an inflation problem. It was a supply shock and a supply shock needs the manifestation of more and more bank printing of loans to propel it into the future. We're getting the opposite. The ultra longs are trading two to three standard deviations below the ET. Yeah. So he is essentially making the claim here that ultra long treasuries are the place to be because right now they are yielding a lot of money. But in the future, the Fed is only going to cut rates. Thus, the value of these high yielding bonds are going to go up and the value of the dollar is going to go down. And the yields are not going to be as high as they are now for quite some time. So by going ultra long now, you're getting a much, much better deal on a way to diversify away from this economy that is going to shite and the overall banking sector that is going to shite. Although I guess we'll see how that goes if the US defaults on its debt, but that's all another problem for another video. Now, speaking of inflation, we got the latest CPI, or I should say the CPI today. The castration of purchasers index registered 4.9% inflation year over year on all items, mostly driven down downward by energy and gas. Some of the higher segments were shelter and so on and so forth. Food was still pretty hot year over year. All items, food and energy up 5.5% year over year. And this is the 10th straight month of inflation easing. And more importantly, we are finally in the range of where the Fed's rates are. It is generally accepted that you want interest rates to be higher than your inflation rate. Right now, interest rates are at the 5 to 5.25% region. And with inflation on all items up 4.9% and 5.5%, you're at a turning point where inflation rates are starting to get to that area where we're very, very soon going to be averaging lower than interest rates. We're at that crossroads. In the beginning of the cycle, you had interest rates at near zero and inflation at eight to nine percent. Now you have interest rates at about five percent and inflation at about five percent. So that's a very, very big improvement. You can imagine pretty soon you're going to have inflation way under the interest rate. That said, I'd argue a big, big problem is that consumers are still being pummeled by some of the most expensive items on the CPI report. For example, gas prices have been going down pretty aggressively, even though OPEC is trying to keep them up, but gas prices have still been going down. However, if you look at something like shelter costs, which take up a much bigger portion of one's income. Well, those are up 8.1% year over year, right? So there's still a lot of room for corrections there. And yeah, that area does tend to be a little bit delayed when you have a Fed tightening period. But still, that's pretty, pretty disastrous. If shelter costs are up 8.1%, that's like the biggest line item on a family's budget after, say, taxes. Now, if you use the 1980 CPI before the government corrected the CPI for accuracy, well, that has registered inconsistently higher this entire cycle. It's usually at like 8 or 9% higher than where the current CPI reports inflation has been. It probably is true that the 1980 CPI would show this 4.9% inflation as being like 10 to 12% inflation, maybe a little less. But regardless of whatever data you're looking at, the overall picture is that inflation is becoming less and less of a problem. It's still a big problem and consumers, their wallets have been destroyed by this and it's gonna have a lot of negative impacts going into the coming years, which are gonna be much, much more slim for the economy. But the fact that the trend of inflation is moderating is very, very good. And it makes sense because so much liquidity has been drained. The Fed about a year ago had the decision to either destroy the economy and collapse the banks or keep inflation elevated. And obviously they decided on this route. We've already seen the biggest bank collapses since 2008, and the economic data across the board is on a pretty steep downtrend, unless you're counting the fake job postings. And so we could see that they're getting that trade-off. Now, in terms of monetary policy effects of this, while well, markets now think there's a 90% chance that the current target range at 500 to 525 basis points will stay the same at the June meeting, as opposed to a 78% chance a day ago. Markets now think that the July 26th meeting has a 38% chance of a 25 basis point cut up from 29% a day ago. In other words, this report has further convinced markets that the future Fed trajectory is next meeting a pause, the next meeting a cut. So anyways, let us know what your thoughts are on all this new information and the banking sector. What do you think the health of the banking sector is going to look like? Are we finished with bank collapses or are we going to see more bank collapses? Do the regulators have this under control? Are these banking collapses just a transitory situation? Well, let us know down below and make sure to take advantage of that 60% off coupon code, coupon code WAR before it expires tonight. Have a good one, folks.